Welcome everybody to this first session of Ask the Expert. Um, I'm Marco from Black Legal Machinist and today we are joined by Sarangarud. Sarangarud is the product manager at Walter Tools and has been working there for over uh, seven years. As you know, a couple of weeks ago, we polled the community and asked you to ask questions about a very specific topic, which is um, indexable drilling. And so today we have the expert with us who's going to answer all your questions. Uh, hi, Sarang, welcome with us. Hey, Marco, uh, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. Right. How about you? Good, good. Uh, quite excited uh, to have this opportunity. Uh, this should uh, this should be quite interesting and hopefully uh, informative for uh, for the audience. Nice. So let's, without further ado, let's get into it. And let's start with the first question that I think it's a perfect question to introduce the topic. Uh, some of our followers on Instagram asked, what is indexable drilling and how should I do it? All right, uh, that's a pretty good question. Uh, as you said, a good, good start, uh, pretty basic question. So indexable drills typically are two types. They are considered indexable. Uh, the one is, uh, for example, uh, square inserts or trigon inserts. Uh, basically, as long as you have an insert in a steel body, typically that's called an indexable drill. Now, there's two types to that further. Uh, sometimes they're called point drills or replaceable tip drills. And what you're looking at here on the screen, it's a true indexable drill. Uh, here you can see that there's a square inserts, uh, a center insert and a periphery insert and uh, hardened and polished surface, spiral flutes, all of these features, a measuring collar to mic uh, the drill size so that you don't have to take the drill out uh, to find the nomenclature or the diameter. But these are typically indexable drills. Uh, our drills look like so. A lot of our competitors, uh, world-class competitors have very similar drills as well. So that's one type. The other is uh, what we call a point drill or replaceable tip drill. Here also, uh, these are hardened and polished flutes. Um, in fact, the flutes are also ground. The margins are ground uh, on the inserts. So these are called point drills. You can see there's 140 degree point angle and the seat itself is 100 degree seat. Uh, but the point I'm making is these type of drills uh, mimic quite closely solid carbide drills. So they're extremely uh, productive and really good surface quality, surface finish and so on and so forth. So both of these are technically called indexable drills. Okay. And the second part of the question is, how should I do it? Do we have some recommendation on how to properly do indexable drilling? How to, uh, say that again? How to do indexable drilling. Is there any specific recommendation you have? Uh, well, I mean, um, typically you have a certain uh, way to hold these. You have adapters. So if it's a machining center or a lathe uh, turret, um, Depending on that, uh, there are different ways to hold these drills. Uh, hydraulic holders, shrink fit holders, or in a, you know, in a lathe, it's a certain way to hold these. We also have some of these as capto uh, connections and such. And uh, yeah, there are feeds and speeds. Uh, you have usually through coolant systems for uh, these drills. They do require chips to get out, absolutely. And um, yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, it works like any other drill. So. Perfect. So moving on to the second question, this seems like a very like uh, personal question to the person who asked, but uh, it might happen to everybody else. Um, why do bottom drills blow up every time I use them? <laughs> uh, all right, I guess that's a very uh, generic question. So I'll have to probably give a very generic answer because uh, since I'm not there in the shop where this is happening, I can't troubleshoot it. So in general, I would say, uh, let me handle it in a few ways, all right? So pool wear um, breakage is one way to look at it. So chipping, right? Uh, inner insert sometimes can chip. Um, 
it's either because the grade is too hard and you're pressing the insert without any uh, cutting speed at the center, the cutting speed is zero. And if the grade is too hard, then it can chip. And once it chips, uh, it can blow up uh, the entire tube. Uh, same thing happens uh, with periphery insert as well on the outside, All right? If the grade is wrong, if the feed is too high, uh, it can cause serious damage. Um, another uh, possibility is uh, not enough coolant, no through coolant that can create a lot of heat and um, that can seize the drill or blow up the insert. Um, another would be, um, it's not aligned properly. For example, you can see here, either the chips are getting recut or maybe the drill wasn't aligned properly if it was in a lathe, for example. Uh, what you're seeing here is pitting on the flute side. But if you see this portion, um, sometimes if your X coordinate on the is on the minus side, your drilled hole can actually end up being smaller than the designated diameter of the drill. And then you are in a situation where the steel is starting to engage on the finished workpiece. That can create some serious issues for the drill as well. So there are various things. Um, even the alignment of the machine itself can be a problem. If it's unstable workpiece uh, work holding, that, uh, that's another problem. So any of these things can cause um, drills to blow up basically. We hope this answered the question of our follower and it's not going to happen again. Yeah. Um, the next question we received is, um, are indexable drills worth using on manual lathes or is it better to just stick to large uh, high-speed steel drills? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, the short answer is, yeah, they can be used on a manual lathe. But I think um, as this person probably already has figured out, they may not be the most efficient drills to be used on manual lathes. Uh, first of all, the through coolant capacity of manual lathes may not be the greatest. And these drills do require a lot of coolant to get the chips out. Uh, the other thing is on manual lathes, uh, the feed can be a problem. Uh, as long as you have the automated feed mechanism, I believe it's called compound feed on manual lathes, uh, then at least you have consistent feed and high enough feed with the high horsepower, then you can get the chips out, uh, chips to break and chips get out. Otherwise, with the coolant and the feed, that can be a problem. Uh, so in general, um, plus a lot of our inserts and a lot of our global competitors inserts as well have very unique uh, optimized grades. Uh, ours have a lot of aluminum oxide. It kicks in for high speeds. So unless you're running it at a high enough uh, speed and feed, you're not getting the best out of these inserts either. So yeah, short runs you can do, but not the best use of these drills, uh, if you ask me, uh, to be put on a manual weights. I see. All right, thanks. Uh, next question is, at what size does it become economic to use an indexable drill versus a carbide drill? Um, Size-wise, our drills for Walter um, start at about 12 millimeters, uh, indexable drills. Um, in general, it's a tussle between um, how much carbide you are willing to break, because carbide is very expensive. So. Typically, solid carbide drills go up to 20 millimeter diameter, sometimes 25 millimeter diameter. And then the length to diameter is much deeper for solid carbide drills. Uh, but uh, indexable drills uh, below 12 millimeters, uh, some of our competitors have it uh, less than 12 millimeters as well. The problem is uh, it's not about just the economy. The screw insert screw becomes too small and then it becomes uh, very tedious to engage the insert into the drill body. Uh, operators lose the screw in the lathes or machining centers all the time. It's too small to engage. Uh, it doesn't hold strong enough. A lot of those problems kick in as well. So about 12 millimeters uh, is where it starts going as big as, you know, our, our standard go up to two and a quarter inch, you know, but 
we have cartridge drills that go much, much bigger, more than four inch diameters. And they can go much, much bigger beyond that as well. And length to diameter ratio wise, up to five to six times diameter is when the indexable stops, up to 10 or 12 times diameter is when the point drills stop. So that's typically the range where indexable drills are used. Are there any volume considerations there? Uh, depending on how many parts need to be machined, does that affect uh, the selection of you know, insert drills versus carbide? Uh, yes and no. It really depends on the type of industry you are in and your uh, requirement. You know? So if, it's, um, if, if you want a high productivity, a high volume environment, uh, absolutely, these drills can be used with that. A uh, lot of times, uh, other considerations come in as well. For example, curved surface, inclined surface, uh, that's where indexable drills come in quite handy compared to a solid carbide drill, for example, because you don't need to spot drill, spot face it. So a lot of those considerations come in as well. Okay. And I think, I believe you already kind of answered the next question that I'm going to ask you anyways. Uh, somebody asked, are they worth their price? Uh, yeah, again, I mean, uh, absolutely. Short answer is absolutely. And uh, the good thing about indexable drills is, as I said, if you blow up the insert, you still have a possibility uh, to hit the uh, emergency stop or uh, disengage. And at least you have the steel body intact, which you can be reusing over and over. With a solid carbide drill, once you blow up the drill, it's gone. Um, that's another, um, yeah, so yeah, there is absolutely many reasons where many justifications where indexable drills are worth their price. Okay. The next few questions that we have, we have three more questions left, are a little bit more technical uh, or application yeah. specific. So starting from um, somebody asked, if we want to drill or an inclined service, uh, what is the strategy there? Uh, what is the maximum inclination angle? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I actually happen to have a really good video that will explain this. So let me start the video here. So you can see we call this Swiss cheese demonstration. So this is a steel uh, 4140, AISI 4140, or for the international folks, uh, this is 42CRMO material. And uh, we are turning a piece of steel to look literally like Swiss cheese with a lot of cross holes, a lot of inclined holes and such. So you can see there's a lot of incline here and also sharp angles. So a lot of Walters, all of Walter indexable drills can do, do these things. For example, this one, you are now looking at a curved surface and on an offset. So of course, feeds and speeds need to be adjusted for it. But yeah, absolutely, you don't need a spot face as you can see here, right? So you have it. Um, speed this up a little. And then the next one is you can see, um, so again, offset, curved surface. Now you can see the specific question that uh, this questioner asked. Uh, you can see this is a 90 degree included angle. So it's engaging at 45 degree incline. Absolutely no spot facing required, no piloting, nothing. People are just going in, a lot of interruptions there. Uh, it's almost like a milling. Uh, then it's exiting at 45 degrees as well. Included angle is 90 degrees, right? So no strategy per se, as long as you have the right quality build, right grades, right cutting feeds and speeds, you can absolutely do it. Uh, this gets me every time. What you're looking at here is the drill is entering at that 90 degree angle. So you're not spot facing, you're literally entering at the sharp edge. Here. So this is unbelievable. When I first saw this demonstration, I just couldn't believe my own eyes. So there you go. Uh, you can see there is a, a pocket created in that 90 degree included angle. Now you're opening it up on a lathe. 
this is unbelievable again so yeah so if you have the right quality grow and the right grades you can absolutely do a lot of these operations um i'll again speed this up a little but so you can see that there is a cross hole going on here the incline entry and then it's going through a cross hole now this is yet another very complex uh, operation kind of like a chain drilling it's going on an incline surface at the entry while it also encounters a cylindrical surface on the other side as the hole getting big so you can see that again it's one of those very surreal looking uh, operation for a drill to perform right here yet again now you are entering that 90 degree angle incline in entrances on both sides and a curved surface and you can see from previous hole how it looked on here so yeah um, as long as you have the right feet right depth of cut or a right uh, a right pull and strategy all of those it comes in and plays a role right so hopefully that um, answers uh, that question a little bit perfect Uh, so okay. moving on, the next question is a little bit more specific to uh, Walter drills. Uh, somebody asked, by using a D forty one forty, we can do stacked plate drilling. What other Walter products have uh, this capacity? Um, I guess let me share my screen again and uh, here. So. the problem with uh, so d41 body is that point drill so yes point drill has a 140 degree included angle and it does not create an exit a uh, cap so laminate drills or stacked plate the problem is literally these are different stacked plates either an inconel shroud on a tube sheet uh, in front of a mild steel or low carbon steel uh, base plate or multiple uh, stack plates of low carbon steels and such and when the drill exits the first plate and enters the second plate sometimes there is a gap and you can see the red part here that's the exit gap from the first plate so it's a steel cap that's completely loose and it breaks loose and it kind of gets recut with the inserts and what that does is um it breaks the insert in the process so there are ways for indexable drills to be able to do this operation there are strategies i used to do, design these drills in my past life and uh, there are strategies where you can minimize how big this disk gets and in that case walters inserts and inserted drills can be used but typically those are special designs not standard designs so there you have it so as a standard product walter has uh, point drills the d4140 but you can absolutely get these specially designed to make the laminate drills right. okay uh and this takes us to our last question for this as the expert section um is it possible to drill half bore on a workpiece with the B4112 uh and the specifics of the part are diameter is 12 mm depth for 40 mm and it's a through hole so this is a very technical question very specific okay so a through hole two times diameter indexable drill can you do half and half um yes you can you can enter the workpiece from one side do the hole um turn the workpiece around and then come from the other side and uh, the two holes meet now a few things you have to be very careful about in such half and half situations is uh, you have to make sure your machines are aligned properly otherwise there is going to be a mismatch between the two axes uh, so the hole coming from this side and hole coming from that side needs to be act correctly you know you need to have it fixed correctly the work holding should be steady and alignment should be and even then you should reduce your feel when you come from the other side and engage the previously left hole from this side so the convex side uh, you will have to engage it uh, properly and then you're going to have a ring remaining that you need to uh, 
clean out when the both the operations are done. So as long as you take correct precautions, absolutely this can be done. Perfect. All right. So this was the last question for today. I'm sure that as we publish this video and post it on Practical Machines, we'll get many more questions in the comments. So um, Sarang, stay tuned because we'll probably reach out again to ask you questions. Okay. But uh, for today, thank you very much for uh, your time and taking time to explaining indexable drilling to us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I thought it was very informational. So again, thank you very much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting this. And uh, hopefully this, as I said, should be uh, informative for all the audience. For sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye-bye, Marco. Bye.